verses here. We're going to read, matter of fact, Luke, the first chapter, the 35th verse. And then we're going to read Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the 12th verse. I'm going to read that out of the Amplified. And then we're going to read 1 Peter 1, 23. Again, Luke, the first chapter, the 35th verse. Uh, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, the 12th verse. I'm going to read that out of the Amplified. And then we're going to read 1 Peter 1, 23. All right. If you don't have it, just look on the screen there and uh, not write it down. Go back. And we're going to get into our teaching tonight. Look what it says here. And the angel replied to her, who, Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Uh, Hebrews, the fourth chapter, I'm going to read that out of the Amplified. For the word that God speak is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. That's where we uh, get our, our theme for effective living ministry right there from that scripture. And it is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating the dividing line of the breath of life, soul, and the immortal spirit and joints of marrow of the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and sifting and analyzing and judging the very thoughts and purposes of heart. And then finally, 1 Peter 1, 23. Let's read it. Since you've been born again or been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of an imperishable through the living an enduring word of God. As a talking point tonight, let's talk about born of the spirit. Born of the spirit here. And uh, I'm just going to do a quick recap of last week because we started a teaching on the Holy Spirit. And uh, last week we kind of ended the teaching talking about who we are in Christ Jesus. We talked about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And we said, how come the church today are not really walking in that ministry of the Holy Spirit? And we say God has given us the Holy Spirit to comfort us, to lead us, to guide us, and to direct us. And we gave the analogy last week that uh, during the Roman days when they would have the marathon, when they would run the race, the last leg of the race during the Roman marathon, they would allow a paraclete, that's what they called them, a paraclete to jump in the race with the lead runner. And that paraclete was designed to cheer the runner on all the way to the end because it got tired. And so here Jesus, he named the Holy Spirit in Greek, is called a paraclete. One who goes alongside of you, who's there to cheer you on when the race gets tough. Because we say, this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So God's saying, in this race and in this walk, and I want you to get this in your spirit. Because once we learn again how to lean on the Holy Spirit, how to listen to his voice, we're going to see some victories happen in our life. We're going to see some things begin to transform in our life. And then last week we talked about what things hinder us listening to the Holy Spirit. Watch this church. What things really hinder us from listening to the Holy Spirit? We said busyness. When you get so busy that you can no longer feel when the Spirit of God prompts you to do something. You can't feel His presence. Why? Your mind is racing. Your spirit is tormented. You're grieved all the time. Or you're carrying something so heavy that you can no longer feel the nudging of the Holy Spirit. This past week God gave me a uh, a quick example. He said, is your life a tugboat that's always carrying or pulling a load? Or are you a cruise liner that's enjoying the scenery on your way to a beautiful destination? See, you're either one of them. God never designed us to pull a load. He never designed us to carry the load. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit, to lead you, to guide you. And then we read in Scripture, in, in Mark, the first chapter, it says, Jesus got up a great while before day, went out to a solitary place, and there he played, prayed, Mark 135. So we see Jesus, his practice was that he would get up, go to a solitary place, and he would get his instructions from God. Remember we gave the analogy also that when Elijah was on the mount, that God came by and there was an earthquake and there was a fire and there was a rattling and God wasn't in any of that but in a still 
small voice. That's when God spoke. How do we hear God's voice? When we begin to quiet our spirit. When we begin to cast all of our cares upon God. And then, then we can hear from God because we know God caring for us. So one of the ways that we begin to yield to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, young and old, watch the things God can speak to you. Watch the ideas God will allow to come to you because you quiet yourself. You quiet your mind. No reason in the world, all this word we have, and then you have the spirit. Watch this. The spirit of the living God living on the inside of you. No other faith can say they have the spirit of the living God down on the inside. Not Buddhist, Jehovah Witness. This Mormon Latter day Saint, these faith actually they push the spirit of God away. But here God is said in Luke eleven thirteen, how be it if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more would the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? And remember, we said the Holy Spirit searches all things, the deep things of God. So the things the Holy Spirit search out about God, he brings them back and he gives them to us. See how much is available to us? And here we are wondering, God, what is it you want me to do? What am I called to do? One of the things we said we must do is quiet ourselves, And then the Spirit of God will begin to minister to you. Then we say one of the second things that keep us from hearing or operating under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we say unrepented sin. Unrepented sin because it breaks the fellowship. God is not divorced from you, but it breaks the fellowship with God. And we gave the analogy, it's just like a marriage. You still marry, but when you have an argument with your spouse or an argument with your friend, the communication line is broken. And you can't hear. And then we gave the analogy of David, the 51st Psalm. He said when he messed up with Bathsheba or he slept with Bathsheba, he said something in his prayer. He said, God, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Then he said, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then he said, take not your Holy Spirit from me. So we see unrepented sin, unforgiveness, bitterness, resentment, it stifles our relationship with the Holy Spirit. The most he's going to do is keep nudging you, forgive, forgive, repent, repent. God won't move on from there. So we said we have to repent of that. Make it a habit, church, when you come before God. Confess John 1 and 9, 1 John 1 and 9. He said if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you. And then he said he will cleanse you. What are we doing? We're opening up the avenues for God. Because I believe there's some prosperity and some breakthroughs waiting on us when the Spirit of God begins to lead us and begin to guide us. When we allow him to speak to us, when we allow the spirit of God to pray through us, so many things that's coming to my mind now. That's why we said take advantage of praying in tongues. If you have a prayer language, I want you to begin to pray in the Holy Ghost. Because the Bible said when we pray in the unknown tongue, our spirit man does what? Speaks directly to God. But in the spirit, we do what? Speak mysteries. And that word mystery is the Greek word mysterion. It means the secrets of the king. So when you begin to pray in the Holy Ghost, God said, I'm going to reveal to you now the secrets of the king. And so this is a language God has given you. And so then we read in Corinthians, the second chapter, he said, I have not seen, ear have not heard, neither has it entered into your heart the good things God has prepared, already set for those who love him. But I will, watch this, reveal them unto you by my spirit. Do you see that? He said, these will be the things that are freely given to you. He said, but you got to see it by way of the Spirit of God. And then the third thing we said, how come believers don't walk in the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Depending upon your senses. And I just gave you the scripture for that. God said, what I have for you, your eye cannot see it. Your ear cannot hear it. It's, it's not connected to your natural senses, but it's connected by the Spirit of God. And now our job is to get in the presence of God and begin to listen. Begin to be aware when you're going throughout the day. What did the Holy Spirit speak to? I'm not talking about walking around in the days, but when you're in the spirit of prayer, when the Bible says uh, pray always without ceasing or pray without ceasing, he's not talking about just walking around all day praying. What he's saying is keep yourself in a season of prayer. 
Make time to pray. And when you do now, you're mindful. Be mindful of a person you walk into their presence and all of a sudden now you're kind of grieved or you may pick up what they're carrying. What's happening? God is allowing you to tap into this person. Or, or you hear something or a thought comes to you. Or when in the middle of the night when you're sleep leaving, all of a sudden you wake up out of a sound sleep and your sleep is gone. That's the time for you to get into prayer. Remember we said last week in Job when God said, uh, God speak once, then twice, but man cannot perceive. But when deep sleep falls upon man, God opened up his ears and God said, I will seal my instructions to draw you away from your purpose. And so many times God will speak in the midst of sleep to draw you away from your purpose. So he said, I can seal my instructions in your heart. And that's why we said, and as I read in the recap, that's why we find out a lot of times Michael Jackson was taking the sleeping drugs because there's a spiritual principle there that your spirit man is more uh, acute and sensitive when you're asleep because why? Your mind is shut down. You're not thinking about the worries because your spirit man never sleeps. That's the part of you that never sleeps. So that was the recap from last week. And today, this week, we're talking about being born of the Spirit. And when I say that, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ now, uh, Peter 1.23 says something. I want you to catch this. He says this, and let me read it again. He said, since you have been born again, not of a perishable seed. That word seed in Greek is spora, and it, we get our English word sperm from. And so God says, when you gave your life to me, I impregnated your spirit with my seed, my sperma. And now you have the same nature as I do. That's why I tell people that I was born a homosexual. Well, that's why God said, you must be born again. See, because God said, I will put my sperma, my spora rather, in you. And now you will begin to take on the nature of God. You see how this spiritual principle works here? And God says now, it's an imperishable seed. There is no miscarriages with this. There is no stillbirth. There is, it won't be any fallopian tube births with God's spirit or with God's seed. Because God says, when I impregnate you with my word, you are going to take on my spirit now. And now every time you read the, God, read the word of God, you're going to begin to nourish the nature God has given you. And now you're going to be able to see like God. See Ephesians 5 and 1, be imitators of God as dear children imitate their father. Now do you see how the enemy tried to get most of the people in the body of Christ to be spiritually retarded? And when I say that, that uh, chronologically you're old in God, but your spirit has not grown. You've been walking with God for 20 years, but you have not fed your spirit of uh, the word of God or you have not fed your spirit the milk of the word of God that makes you grow. And so now our body is growing. Our knowledge of the church world is growing. But God is asking this question, is your spirit man growing? You see this? Believers, you live from the inside out. Here's where your victory comes from. Let me parenthetically insert this. Your battle is not in the natural realm. If you read the book of Ephesians, and, and we're going to get back to the scripture here, but I felt led to go this way. Your battle, Paul keeps talking about, is in the heavenly places. That's not talking about heaven. He's talking about the unseen realm. And he said, if you can conquer this realm here, he said, you can conquer what's going on in the natural forces. That's why Jesus never fought with anybody in the natural because he's saying we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, watches, spiritual wickedness in the unseen realm, heavenly realm. That's where your fight is as a believer. So as we get the word of God and the spirit of God on the inside of us, now you're going to be able to see past what's in front of you. You won't be moved by the person in front of you because God is going to be able to give you a glimpse past this person and you will see what the real motivating factor is. Now see, this is what it means to be born of the Spirit. This is what it means to have eyes that can see and ears that can hear. So first you're going to get the imperishable seed, the Word of God. Now I'm going to give you this scripture here, Luke, the first chapter, the 35th verse. Let me just show you. Now this is not a parable. This isn't just a, a lullaby story. This actually happened here. And the same way Jesus came into the earth 
is the same way you and I was born again. Look what it says. When the angel replied to her, we're in Luke 135, write it down. The angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. When the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary, Mary was impregnated with the Word. Peter 1.23 said you were impregnated the same way. And what happened and what came out of the spirit realm manifested in the natural realm. So when the Holy Spirit impregnated Mary, Mary had a physical birth. When the Spirit of God impregnated us, that we have a God intent for us to have a spiritual, physical change that we can actually see. If you'd have met me 20 years ago, I was on a murderous rampage. But because I got spiritually pregnant with the Word of God, it changed me from the inside out. I had to wait four months to give this testimony here. A friend of mine, uh, him and his wife, and I don't know why I keep getting all of these uh, people coming to me about these pregnancies. But again, they were trying to get pregnant, and uh, they said they went to the doctor. I get what is the artificial insemination? Tried it a few times. I gave them Genesis, the fourth chapter. And it talked about how God said, or Eve said, by the help of the Lord, I've seed a man child. Let me read that here. Let me read it right fast here because I want to show you how power of the Spirit of God, he comes into our life and helps us with everything. What I did was I gave them the word because when we get the word mixed with the Holy Spirit, this is how we begin to progress as believers. See, don't try to fight your friend in your own strength. Don't fight your spouse in your own strength because Paul said everything the believer fights with is in the unseen realm. And the word of God helps us to fight in the unseen realm. Look what it says here. Adam was intimate with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. She said, watch this, I have had a man child with the Lord's help. Notice what she said, the Lord's help. As we as believers, and now we're going to go into our lesson. I know that was a long, lengthy introduction. But everything we do now, God has designed us as, to, as believers to be power assisted. Write down Acts 1 and 8. Write down Acts 1 and 8 here because I want you to get this in your spirit. Stop fighting these battles in your own strength. And when you learn to do that, watch the burden begin to lift. Many times we're carrying the burdens when God said, cast what? All your cares upon me because I care for you. Everything that we do as a believer, God intended for us to cast it on him. He or she won't act right in. Start praying in the Holy Ghost about it. Start putting that word on it. What you're doing, you're cutting this thing down in the spirit realm. When, when, here's the art of teaching that I've learned. I stop preaching against people's action. You preach against the attitude in the heart because the action is only a result of what's going on in the heart. And when we begin to attack what's not seen, the actions begin to straighten out. That's why Jesus, everything that he spoke about, notice the Pharisees and scribes, it says it, it pricked their heart. And they were upset. Jesus never really confronted them. But what he said, it got to the core of their heart. So we as born-again believers, we are designed to be power-assisted. Look what Acts 1 and 8 says. But you shall receive power when? When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. I want to stop right there. God said the power comes to your life when the Holy Spirit come upon you. If you are born again and spirit-filled, the Spirit of God now is designed to assist you. Here's an analogy here. I remember growing up as a child, I remember getting in that, those cars my dad had. Remember the steering wheel was so hard to turn? You know why? No power steering. But as time went along, they gave us power steering. Now you can turn the whole vehicle with one finger. Power brakes, you had to almost stand two feet on the brakes to stop the car. But now what happened? They gave you power now to assist you in stopping assist you in steering. Now God said, I've given you the Holy Spirit to stop you from saying the things you're, supposed, you're not supposed to say. I've given you the Holy Spirit so you can make the right turn in your life.
I've given you the Holy Spirit so you can stop right on the dime because your life has been designed by God to be worked along with or be guided by the Holy Spirit. So he said, when you got born again, he said, you shall receive dunamis now. Power to become not just a witness for God, to do whatever God has called you to do. You see how this thing works now as a born again believer? We're trying to do things in our own strength. God said, I design you to work along with the Holy Spirit. Right now in the book of Philippians, you know what it says. Some things, all things through Christ Jesus that strengthen me. Church, it's almost now we got to go back and train ourselves to depend on the Holy Spirit. We said, when you pray, he said, when you pray, believe that God is going to do it and it shall be done. I'm paraphrasing. But all God is asking you to do is believe. He didn't tell you to try to figure it out. He didn't tell you to see which way it's going to come. He said your job is to pray and believe. Spirit of God does the rest. Amen. Now you see how God works along with us. And here we are. As soon as we pray, we get up off our knees. Now God, how are you going to do it? And you pick that burden right up again and you start carrying it. And that's when the spirit of God should kick in and say, now cast all your cares upon God. Your biggest fight, sometimes we fight against God. God is pulling on it. You pull it back. He pull it again. You pull it back. And now you playing tug of war with God. God is actually telling you to pray and walk away from it. That's all he's asking you or telling you as a born again believer. Write down Zechariah, the fourth chapter, verses six and seven. All of these scriptures I'm going to is actually encouraging you as a believer, as a child of God, to lean on the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, this scripture here talks about Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel being a military officer and he was going through some things. And this is what God spoke to him. The word of the Lord came to Zerubbabel saying this, not by strength or military might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And look what he said in the next verse. What are you, O great mountain before Zerubbabel? God is saying the mountain that's before you, it won't be a problem if you begin to lean on the spirit of God. Nothing becomes impossible for the believer once you tap into the Spirit of God here. Once you begin to use all the tools, look at all the tools God gave you. He gave you prayer. He gave you the Holy Spirit. He gave you the Word. He gave you praying in tongues. And all we need to do now is listen for Him and listen to Him. What happens when we begin to pray for people or begin to speak the Word of God? The Bible says this. He tells us to fight the good fight of faith. Nowhere in the Bible God has told us to fight the devil. And here we are, spend hours and hours Satan, I bind you, and you wrestling with the devil, and you fasting and you doing this to tear the devil's kingdom down. Now, okay, it's times we rebuke the devil, but God said your biggest fight is the fight of faith. Notice how challenging it is for you to believe God. So he tells you to fight the good fight of faith. And that's believing what God has said. Now, just imagine if you spend all the time listening, the time you spend listening to what the enemy says. How much time do we spend listening to what the enemy said? He said, you're not going to make it. He's not going to change. She's not going to change. How are you going to pay the bills? You know this bill is coming up. This is due. You hearing all of this, how much of, how much of the spirit of God do you hear? Just, just, just think about it. How much of God do you actually hear compared to all the negative things you hear? And all he's doing, and notice how your spirit man is built up with negative images. You, you're constantly fighting off negative voices. Why? That's what you're hearing all day. And so now we got to train ourselves to listen to what God is saying by the spirit of God. Write down Ephesians 3 and 20. Church, when we learn to do this, what a powerful church we're going to be together. And, and notice this. These are scriptures you've read over and over again, but applying them. Applying these scriptures to your life. Look what it says in Ephesians 3 and 20. I'm talking about being born of the Spirit. Because if you're born of the Spirit, that means your life is a direct result of what, where, what God has for you, what he should be doing in you. Your whole life consists of coming out 
of the Spirit of God. It says in Ephesians 3 and 20 here, Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask a thing, but it's according to. Now, God says, Now unto him or her is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, but it's according to a power that works in us. And here it goes back again. This power that's on the inside of us, it's this faith that we have. It's mixed with the Spirit of God. It's when we get this word down on the inside of us. Just, just imagine, church, if you, if you did everything that you know. Sit there and think about how much scripture you know. Now ask yourself, how much of it do you actually step out on? How much of it do you believe? Intellectually, you know it. But how much of it do you actually step out on? Because if we actually did this, turn to Luke, the 18th chapter here. Luke, the 18th chapter. My God, that time went by fast. Because I want to show you something here. If you believe, if you believe what God has said, you would do what Luke 18 says. Now, he said something here. He said something. I'm going to read it here. That time went back pretty fast. But he gave us a parable or a principle here in Luke, the 18th chapter. And I'm talking about being born of the spirit. All of your work is just about done in the spirit realm. The next step, you just step out. When the Holy Spirit tells you to move, you move. That's, that's all it is. Your work is done in prayer. Your work is done by meditating on the word. And then when the spirit of God prompts you to do something, you just do it. And then it's done. It's kind of like Jesus when he told Peter, go to the sea, cast the hook, and you're going to catch a fish. All Peter had to do was do what? Obey. Everything God tells us to do is just based on obedience. Saul, go kill all the Amalekites. That's all he had to do. So when God speak, all we have to do is obey. Nothing else. That's all he's asking us to do. When I speak, you obey. Well, God, how are you going to do it? You know, I want to get out there and you don't do it, God. You're going to make me look like a fool. See, that's what we really go through. Yeah. Is God really going to do it? Many times you won't know until you step out and do it. But we really, check this out. You really don't trust God. I had to come to that conclusion one day. I said, God, I, I trust you in this area. This area, I don't trust you. And so what I had to do, I started reading the scriptures. I, I got as many scriptures as I can. I got my concordance. And I started building myself up until my baby started kicking. Until your dreams start kicking. You will feel something build up on the inside of you so it compels you to step out. The reason why we don't step out on many things is because our spirit man is not built up in that area. Notice this. You have a lot of faith in this area, but this area you are anemic. You know why? You know most likely a lot of scriptures in this area. And you can quote those scriptures. And you know what they said. And then on occasions God has done something. You are safe in that area. But God will point somebody out and say they're in a wheelchair. Go pray for them. Mm -mm, God, I ain't going to get embarrassed and going over there laying hands on those folks. They're going to come over there and say, what you doing? Then they're going to come back the next day and say, I'm still sick. Your prayer didn't work. All you're doing is what God asked you to do. That's all you're doing. Remember the story. I know I'm going to get to Luke 18, but I keep telling that story. The woman in the 60s, she had her orphanage. God told her to get up and be on the corner of 5th Street. This is in New York. Be on the corner of 5th Street in the white dress in the 60s. She got up and she obeyed and she was on that corner at 9 o'clock. A limousine pulled up. The window came down. It was a white woman. And she said, God told me there would be a woman on this corner in a white dress and I'm to give her $1 million. Now, how come God didn't tell the black woman it would be a white woman? Because in the 60s, segregation. They had nothing to do with one another. He didn't tell the white woman or the Caucasian woman was going to be a black woman. I'm not giving that so-and-so a million dollars. But see, both of them just obeyed. That's all God is asking you to do. When Jesus said, those that are born of the Spirit is like the wind, they come and they go. See, God never give you the in-between instructions because, for one, it wouldn't be faith and it wouldn't be trust. All he's looking for is what? Obedience. That's all he's looking for is obedience. And so in doing that, you lean on God. Now, in between this, I want to give you the scripture here and we're going to close out here. Look what it says in Luke, the 18th chapter. It says, he then told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not become discouraged 
He said, you need to keep praying and don't get discouraged. Why did Jesus say that? Because he knew we were going to get discouraged when we keep praying and we don't see anything happen. How many times you kneel down to pray about something and nothing happened? Jesus said, keep on praying. Now, you know the story here. There was a judge in a certain town who didn't fear God or respect man. And the widow in that town kept coming to him saying, give me justice against my adversary. Look what it says in verse 4. For a while he was unwilling, but later he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or respect man, yet because this woman keeps pestering me, that's persistence, church. It's persistent. I will give her justice so she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. I mean, old girl just kept on coming. I mean, look at the situation she was in. She was a widow. That means she didn't have a son. She wasn't allowed to work because it was the Middle East. Obviously, somebody wronged her, but she knew all I got to do is keep going, keep going to him. Now, Jesus contrasted this prayer with something. Look at verse 6. He said, listen to what the unjust judge says. What did he say? The woman was persistent. She kept coming, but Jesus contrasted something here. But he said, will not God grant justice to his elect who cry to him out day and night? Will he delay to help them? What is Jesus saying? He said the judge took a long time answering. He said God is not going to delay if you stay persistent. She waited a long time. Jesus said, God is not like the unjust judge. God will go to answer speedily. But the question is this in verse 8. I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice, but nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? What is Jesus saying? The very fact that you keep on praying shows that you have faith. And, and I had to see that within myself. When I stopped praying about certain situations, it's because I no longer believed it was going to happen. So I stopped praying about it. So God is saying this. When you keep praying, it shows that you have faith that you're pray, what you're praying about. And so this is what God means about uh, walking in the spirit. That we're going to uh, close with this. That as you continue to pray, you got to know God is listening to everything that you pray. And many times as we're praying, God is working on our heart. Many times God wants you to examine your heart. Why are you praying about this? Many times when you go before God, you examine yourself. Why is it that you want this? Am I doing the things God would have me to do? Many times it's just a self-examination. And then at times you're going to see God answer things very speedily. But the key to all that we said today, because you're born of the Spirit, God is going to show you some things. He would demonstrate some things to you. Let me go read this last scripture here in Peter. In Peter, the first chapter here, and that's going to be our last scripture. It's Peter, the first chapter here, because I want you to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And see, and this thing isn't about you being real deep and closing your eyes while you're driving and, and trying to see what God is going to say to you. When God speaks, you're going to hear it. It's going to be a shift or a change in your spirit. You're going to hear a word that's just going to stick with you. And then you're going to see God begin to do something. I think it's Peter 1, 20, 125 is what I'm looking to looking for. It may be 2 Peter. But it talked about when prophecy came of old time, it came by holy men of God spake as they was moved by the Holy Ghost. Somebody find that for me. Uh, is it 2 Peter? But what does this scripture say? Somebody find that for me. But what is this, the scripture is talking about? It's, it's 2 Peter. One, 2 Peter, the first chapter. And what verse is it? 21. Got my concordance over there. All right, 2 Peter 1, 21 it is. It says, it says, because no prophecy ever came by the will of man, instead men spoke from God as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Why did I bring that scripture up? It's when the Holy Ghost began to move you. There'd be a time when God would give you a word. One translation, God said, their spirit indicated something within them. And, and I want you to be mindful of this. Many times when you start communing with the spirit of God, there will be indicators. What does that mean? A telltale sign. It's going to be a gesture. Spirit of God is going to point something out to you. And that can be your breakthrough, church. 
that can be your breakthrough. As we close, before we got to this location, I kept saying, I'll never go to Hammond. Don't want to go to Hammond. Don't want a church in Hammond. I was convinced I will never, ever go to Hammond. Until God, see, I mean, he spoke this to me. What are you afraid about going to Hammond? And then I said, okay, then I'll look in Hammond. And immediately a door opened. So what am I saying here? When God keep giving you indicators about something, you got to just check it out and see. And then, I mean, many things God would do because for you as a born again believer, he's going to show you some things, but it's going to come from the inside out, church. And see, nobody can teach you this. Only the spirit of God can teach you this. And this is when you become sensitive. To the movings and the proddings of the Holy Spirit. Let's end right there. Father in heaven, we thank you tonight. That every one of your children here tonight, I'm praying, God, that you will make them sensitive to the move of the Spirit of God.